Hello and welcome to the Habit Coach Podcast. I am Ashton Doctor, your Habit Coach. And today we're going to be talking about something that is very essential for us to know. It's about trauma. Now the interesting thing about trauma is that all of us go through some trauma or the other in our life and we have no idea when it's happened to us. Or sometimes we feel it so strongly but have no idea what to do about it later on. So today we have a trauma expert with us. She's a dear friend of mine, so we're going to be giggling our way through the entire podcast. So apologies for that in advance. So our guest today is Lilia. Lilia, welcome to the Happy Coach Podcast. Hi Ashton Doctor, thank you for having me. Most welcome. Lilia, can you tell the listeners a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. So I'm half French, half Indian, and I've been in the wellness space for about 20 years now. Wow. So most of it, my own journey of healing, and now I've been accompanying people for the last five, six years through different modalities. So I do a lot of one-on-one mentoring. I do a lot of trauma healing circles. I also teach yoga. So through yoga, through the body, helping move that trauma as well. And I mean, I do a bunch of other stuff, but I don't want to confuse everyone. So mainly mentoring and a lot of healing through different modalities. So this is very interesting. You said you started many modalities, right? Like what has that journey been? What was the first one that you probably remember starting off? And then how did that transition to all the others? My journey started when I was 16. So I'm now 36. (laughs) So that's 20 years of journeying. Uh, I think one of the first modalities that I uh, was introduced to was very typical psychotherapy. I was seeing a psychiatrist. And many people don't know the nuance between a psychologist and a psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when you say, oh, I used to go to a psychiatrist, people imagine you, you know, in like these, how do you call these outfits, you know, like straight jackets. Yeah, the jackets in a mental institute. And, you know, but actually the only difference is that psychiatrists can prescribe medication and psychologists are not allowed to prescribe medication. But essentially, I used to do what we would maybe call today talk therapy. So. I would just sit and talk to this human once a week, every Thursday Mm -hmm. for very precisely 40 minutes. And that was one of the first things I consciously started doing for myself. And then after that, why did you decide to try something else? If I'm being completely honest, I think I was in such a state of despair that I literally tried everything I could think of, find any... I did every alternative therapy on the face of the earth because I was just having a really hard time being alive. And so I was looking for ways to figure out how can I be alive because I'm here and either I continue being here or I die. That was kind of the... The that options was, that were there. That were the options. So I think it was just that, you know, that thing of survival that kicks in that I was like, okay, I'll try everything, whatever it is, anything, I have to dance up and down, I have to jump sideways, I will, whatever you tell me to do, I will do it. And if I may, I think that's one of the things I would really caution people against is that, you know, when you're in such a state of despair, like I was, you're really vulnerable, you know, and I think whoever is on my side now of the journey, I mean, I'm on both sides, I'm a human first, a mentor, etc. later, is that You know, people are in a really vulnerable state and it's important when you have that authority, that expertise, when someone is coming to you looking for something to be really mindful to never abuse that power. And unfortunately, I have seen it because it's happened to me also, and I've I've seen it in many other instances, that people who have a little bit of authority abuse that and people who are already in a state of pain and suffering go even deeper into that. So if you are one of these people, which we all are in some ways, who has pain, who has suffering, who has trauma, I would say whatever it is you're looking for, be really mindful who you're inviting into your healing journey. That is super important. The person who you're going to look to to help you or support you is super important. And it could be detrimental. Should it be? How would you know Like, if this is the right person? Do you need to go to lots of people and find out? Do you go by recommendations? Like, how would you actually go about figuring this out for yourself? I would say to trust your own intuition, but that's something that's really hard to do when you... It's impossible to find it, right? (laughs) Especially when you're in that state. Yeah, when you're in that state, it's tough. And also, obviously, when you don't trust yourself, it's difficult. 
And when you've never been taught to, how to listen and everyone's conditioned you to listen outside instead of inside, you have no clue really. So if you are connected to your intuition, I would say always listen to that. You get a feel of people. You know, you have that, oh, I'm not feeling this person. If you're not feeling them, just don't question that. Just don't go with them. Right. Otherwise, I think the next safest bet would be to go through a friend, someone who has been to this person and can vouch for them, you know, because then there is that direct feedback loop. If not, I would say, you know, through trial and error also, but having that capacity to very quickly make the right decisions. So I think trusting that feeling that you end up getting is always right, right? Like there's a feeling that tells you, maybe you should not be doing this. Maybe you should be trying something else. Go ahead, run. <laughs> run. Run, follow yeah. that. Lilia, what is trauma? Actually, literally, trauma means wound. Okay. So any wound... You know, if and I think if we think about it as a metaphor, as something that you can relate to physically, then people are like, yes, I get it. Right. So imagine you have, you know, you're walking around and you I don't know, you're in the jungle and you bump into something and you get this huge like cut on your leg. Right. If you just obviously it's there if you don't tend to it and you just leave it like that. It might heal, right? But it might heal not properly, not completely. It might get infected. Some funky stuff might happen to it. Right. It's the same with trauma. You have a wound, which what trauma is, is a wound. And if you, you don't have the capacity to deal with it, it kind of festers. And then you create all of these necessary coping mechanisms to continue living because we continue living, right? So we just go on and, okay, this wound is there. It's going to be there. And, and so, yeah, it's essentially a wound. So if you think about it like that, I mean... Just so trauma is not the funky stuff that happens to the wound. Trauma is the actual wound. Yeah. Trauma literally means wound. Okay. Now, the thing that's a bit tricky with trauma, and I I know you introduced me as a trauma expert. I, I don't I'm not really comfortable with being labeled an expert of anything. Hmm. It's mainly Can I my, just have said traumatic? <laughs> Lilia is traumatic. <laughs> Traumatized <laughs> human. <laughs> she gives me trauma, so I might as well. No, no, I'm just being I'm just trying to be understood. Uh, understood. You know, because I think uh, anyways, that's another topic mm -hmm. on experts. But so trauma it literally means wound. And a lot of times when we can't deal with that wound, because two people can go through the same thing and one is going to be scarred and one is not going to have anything happen or not feel any symptoms from that. So it's not, it is the wound, but it's not necessarily the event. It, it's our perception of that event, how we take the event, how we make sense of the event, what it means to us. So you and I could be in the same car accident and I could make sense of it in a way that I'm stuck there and you could just go on and you're fine. Correct. So it's not necessarily what happens, it's how we're interpreting and how we're experiencing what happens. This is such a powerful thought, right? Because the way that you think about it, the way that you feel it later is actually what you're carrying with you. Are there ways to, you know, bulletproof yourself from trauma happening in the future or understand that maybe if something happens like this in the future, I know how to think about it. I don't think we can bulletproof ourselves against anything in life. I think thinking we can is ludicrous. I think if we're going to be alive, we're going to experience suffering. And that's one of the things I talk about a lot because we're all trying to escape it in some way or form. Right? Instagram is a great escape. Yeah. Sorry, could you repeat your question? <laughs> I was saying, so suffering is what you said that we're all going to go through. Yeah. Right? There's no point running away from suffering. So instead, what do we do about it? We deal with it. Mm. Right? We accept it. I think one of the most powerful things is to really take a moment and sit with the suffering that is inherent in life. It's just part of life. It's like... There's no, you cannot divide life and suffering. If you're alive, you're going to suffer. What you do with that suffering is where there's a bit of agency and power and self, uh, you know, responsibility and accountability. But the fact that you're going to suffer is a given. <laughs> We're all like, going to go through some I mean, form of suffering. If yeah. I can ask you, like, have you ever suffered in your life? All the time. <laughs> you know, so it's, and if we think about it that way, then we're all... You know, if we could just stop pretending, you know, that's one of the things I talk about a lot. Like if we could just stop pretending, stop pretending that we have our shit together, stop pretending that we're not scared when we're scared. Like, for example, you know, I'm going to share this because I messaged you before the podcast. I think this is 
in 20 years of all this wisdom and experience, I've never been on a podcast before. And I have this imposter syndrome, which is one of the symptoms of the trauma that I've been through in my own life. And this morning I was thinking, oh my God, but what am I going to talk about? I don't know what I'm going to say. Is it even going to be interesting? Right. And I messaged you about that and you was like, oh, okay, so what did you say? You said, what's your... What's the name of your imposter? Yeah, <laughs> what's your name of your imposter? And I was like... I think it's Scooby. <laughs> and you were like, okay, I will whack Scooby, right? Or something like that as a joke. And I was like, you know, no, like Scooby is allowed to be here. And that's something that's also important in trauma healing is that we have different parts to us. You know, I've identified a few of my own. And if we carry shame or guilt in those parts, if we try to hide them, which we would call our shadows, right? Right then we feel incomplete and we're at war with these different parts because, oh, how can I also be this? Oh, she, this part of me is gross or, oh, oh, you know, I'm, I'm feeling weird about this part of me. But if we start bringing in, them into the light and welcoming them, like I welcome Scooby, you know, today I was like, okay, you feel like you're, you don't have anything to share. Cool. Come join the party. You're welcome on this podcast as well, <laughs> Scooby, you know? So then we have all these parts and when we bring them together, then we can really heal. What would these different characters be? Like, I understand imposter syndrome, right? Yeah. Like, what are the other categories that we all have? Just to make sure that everyone knows that we all have these in our lives. We all have parts. Right. Uh, and one of the things I say is that there are no bad parts, right? So, a lot of people know about inner child healing, right? A lot of, there's a lot of talk about inner child. So, that Tell would be one. Tell us a little one. bit more about that. So, your inner child is basically little you, hmm. you know, and, and little you is even though you've become a big you, you're still little you inside. You've just grown. And so little you had needs, had wants that were probably not met, mm. whether physically, you know, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, whatever the context. And so that part of you is still there. And that part of you wants attention like a kid, right? So if you don't give attention to that part of you, it's going to show up like a tantrum, you know, and it's just going to get louder like any kid until you like notice it and say, okay, what is it that you need? Oh, you need a hug. Oh, you need me to comfort you. So in my work, when I do one-on-one -on -one mentoring, for example, I do this with people. I'm like, okay, what does little you need right now? You know, and a lot of times little us just needs someone to show up nice. and acknowledge and see them. So little you would be definitely a part that's interesting. You know, then obviously all throughout your experience till this age, there are different parts of you at different ages that are, you know, rocking around inside of you. We're going to take a quick break. See you on the other side. Welcome back. All right, let's jump into the conversation. So, Lilia, this inner child is also part of a way that we deal with trauma? I need you to rephrase that. What do you mean? So, like the way that we were talking about inner child yeah. right now. Yeah. Is that an expression of the trauma? Is that why we have an inner child in us? Because it, we went through something traumatic? No, no, no. Your inner child is you as a child. Okay. Right? And obviously, depending on what you went through in your childhood, it's going to have an expression. So a lot of people who have been through childhood trauma have a very difficult relationship with their inner child. In fact, most of the times they're not connected to their inner child. They have no idea, but the inner child is actually directing their life. But they don't... Oh, they're living through their inner child. Yeah, they're seeing the world through that child because what happens is when you go through such you know, difficult experiences, in your, especially in your childhood, when your consciousness is not formed yet, it leaves an imprint. And so it's kind of like you're, you stay in that state. You keep growing, but mentally, emotionally, you're still there. So you look like an adult. And if you look at, honestly, if you look at any adult relationship, you will see this clearly. Most people, anyways, there's a saying that if it's hysterical, it's historical, right? So anytime you're reacting to something, it's not from the present moment. It's from before. And I see this now when I look at adults in relationships and they're, you know, I'm like, Oh, look at this little child talking to this little child. Actually, all this little child wants is a little attention. And this little child feels like they're being scolded for something, right? And actually, it helps when you look at it through that lens because we're all just kids. All of us had some weird stuff happen in one shape or form, whether severe, light, doesn't matter, right? We all been through something. And now we're these weird adults trying to make sense of the world from the perspective of a child who hasn't really grown up. Because we have things that have not been resolved. Correct. So a lot of the healing work is about 
resolving things, putting them to rest, letting them be in the past. So can I give you an example about this? Yes, so, yes. you know, my inner child is called Lilu, you know, and that's my nickname since I'm a kid, Lilu Lilu. So <laughs> nobody out there, please call me Lilu. <laughs> And, you know, Lilu, how would she show up, right? She would show up throwing tantrums in my relationships, in my life when she wanted something. And I would just shoo her away because she's just bothering me. Like, you know, when kids annoy you and you're like, please leave me alone. I would treat my own self like that, right? That little part of me like that. And what happens is that she, that part of me didn't feel safe to come out anymore because there was no adult around to take care of her. In this case, me as a 36-year-old woman. If I'm not giving her any attention, she doesn't feel like she exists, right? So Lilu would only show up in her negative aspects and annoying aspects, and I would just not want to deal with her. What happens when I started having, as weird as this may sound, conversations with her, and I can share what that looks like, so if anyone wants to try it, they can do that. When I started having conversations with her, all she ever wanted was just an adult to just be there with her. And I think she never got that as a kid. So now as a 36-year-old woman, I have to give that part of me, that child in me, what she never got, which is attention, acknowledgement, recognition for her experience of life. And when I started doing that, I realized that all of her qualities started showing up, her spontaneity, her humor, her like little mischievous like side, all of these qualities, which are childlike qualities, right? So it's like when you medicate yourself. And I remember my first therapist told me this. He's like, you know, I can give you medication if you want to help. You want help with managing your anxiety. And I was like, no, I don't really want that. I want to understand what's happening because I knew that numbing the pain would also numb the joy. You can't numb one without the other. So, And you can't feel the pain if you don't feel the joy. You can't feel. Yeah, but that, you know what, Ashdin, that's one of the biggest issues I see in my work is that people are unwilling to be uncomfortable. And so there's. It's not the suffering that's difficult. It's the not wanting to suffer that's difficult mm. and the stigma around what that means and not knowing or not being able to just sit with your difficult emotions to just be like, yeah, you know what? This really hurts right now. This, whatever this is, it sucks right now, right? And there's an inability to do that. And so many people, when they come to me, they're looking for a quick fix and I'm telling them, well, you... I'm happy to be of service, but we're going to have to sit with all of those things. You should see that. that I don't want. <laughs> no, no. I don't want to relive that. Yeah. But it's not about reliving that, right? It's about acknowledging what is and not trying to escape or numb or dissociate from it, which can be a coping mechanism Correct. at some point. And right? that's a big difference. It's not that you have to relive it. It's just that you have to accept that it happened. You have and to acknowledge it. Acknowledge it. I think one of the biggest elements of healing and what I love in, in my work is that sometimes just telling someone, wow, that must have been hard. I can't tell you the number, interesting, I'm having an emotion. <laughs> the number of people who have just broke down crying just by me saying, oh my God, that must have been hard. Because what were they actually looking for? They just wanted someone to stand there with them and say, wow, I see your pain. That must be tough. That's it. Not, it's okay, you'll be fine. You see, you'll move on and things will... <laughs> no, right? Not trying, not trying to fix it, not trying to get you away from it, just being there with you. And the thing is, we suck at that. We suck at being in uncomfortable places with people. When someone says, oh, my father died, look at people. They're, we become all awkward. We're like, oh, shit, what do I say? Uh, mm, huh? You know, we... I mean... Has it ever, it, I know it's happened to me. Yeah. I've been awkward thinking, what do I say? Yeah. What do you say to someone who just lost their parent? You know, I mean, or their child or whoever. I mean, it's, uh, right? But can you be there with that person in their pain? And that is a huge part of the healing journey, which is missing. You know, even in families, in friend circles, can you be there with the difficult stuff? Can you be real with each other? Can How you would you break it down into steps? Like, how would you say, you know, be there with somebody? You know, like, I can understand the concept. Yeah. Now, how would you put it into practice? Like, would you say, don't worry, I'm here? Would you just hang around, not say anything? What would the situation look like? So, <laughs> I know people love five steps to everything and a simple solution to everything, right? And in some cases, those simple solutions exist. 
I think when we're talking about humans, there is no simple solution. I think that it's a it depends on each individual. So, for example, for you it might look a certain way, and for me it might look a certain way, and they might be completely different. So, w- one of the skills that I think is really important in all of these things is listening. Do you have the ability to listen, and do you have the ability to? also ask questions because a lot of times we assume things right instead of just asking so let's say if if you were going through a difficult time and and the only way i know how to respond to this is by trying it out and modeling it right because it will be it will depend on so many different factors but i would be i would firstly let you know that i'm there for you so should you need anything at all please feel free to reach out to me i would be there what is another thing i would do depending on what i know of you and our a level of relationship and depending on what you're going through i might send something over to your house just you know to show you in action that i'm also there i might check in on you i might ask you what you need is there anything i can do you know i mean it's super simple actually ashton it's just that we need to care enough i think that's also one of the things we need to care enough about each other i think one of the things that i realized about this entire trauma space and understanding and talking to people about the trauma is, is that you have those difficult discussions and everything becomes easier you know we shy away from those difficult discussions and as a result it becomes more and more awkward it becomes more and more <laughs> difficult to have it and i came up with this phrase i said the hardest conversations are the easiest to have right yeah yeah you know if you're sitting with someone and they're trying to tell you something you engage in it or you bring it up and then the conversations like makan because now there are two human beings talking right there's not one facade or one mask trying to talk to another mask right i think that breaking down having those difficult conversations makes i think life so much easier especially around death you know around thoughts of suicide all those things just simply asking are you having thoughts of suicide all right i'm here we can have a conversation about it it's so yeah. simple but yeah. we tiptoe around it oh have you ever hurt yourself and da, da, da. no straight away ask move on i think that's one way that i've noticed that this helps I would say I've noticed that too. I think for example in my own journey when I was going through severe depression, anxiety, suicidal thoughts, I mean the whole, you know, <laughs> shebang. Uh fun stuff. Been there bought the t-shirt. Oh yeah, hmm. tough times, very dark times. I remember one of the black t-shirt. <laughs> That's a sign of healing when you can laugh about this exactly. stuff, right? Like right? Uh, yeah, for sure. Hmm. But you know one of the things I think that was really difficult for me is that I firstly I thought that I was crazy. I thought that something was inherently wrong with me and I felt really alone. Mm. I felt really alone because I saw nobody around me who seemed to display any sort of anything. Right? So I was like, okay, why am I going through this shit and everybody else is just living their life? I didn't understand. I was like, what is happening? I was angry with God, I was angry with the world, I was dying inside, you know. And one thing I remember is at some point I just opened up about it and I was saying, "Hey, you know what? I'm going through a really difficult time and I'm going through depression and I want to die and I don't know what what is happening in my life." And I know now it has a different meaning, but people were like, "Yeah, me too. Me too. Me too." And I was like, "What? Really?" So I opened up about it and then I realized everyone around me was suffering in one way or another. <laughs> It just said nobody was talking about it, you know? And I was like, what kind of a crazy world is this where I'm sitting there dying alone in my mind thinking I'm a crazy human and actually everybody else is dying alone in their mind thinking they're a crazy human. I'm like, why can't we just say, "Hey, I'm dying. Oh, you too. Okay. You feel like shit. Great. Me too. Like how, why can't we just be real about what's really happening for us? And I think that was something that really clicked for me where I was like, okay, I don't want to pretend anymore. You know, I don't want to pretend I have my shit together. I don't want to pretend I'm an expert. I don't want to pretend I'm a, I'm just a human being with a certain experience of life and there's certain things I know and don't know and I'm just moving along that journey. You know, but and i think that's what's missing a lot in the healing space wellness space the world in general relationships in general is can we be real with each other i think that's a huge part of healing and there's a huge part of trauma that's actually cultural you know we live in really toxic cultures you know where 
things that we're promoting as normal are harmful to us as humans. You like, know, like um. I mean, there's so many examples of just like this whole like hustle culture and being busy mm. all the time. You know, toxic positivity. All yeah, those things. I mean, there's we're living so out of sync with our true nature that the list could be endless. We could do a podcast just on that, Ashton. And I know you know because we've had these conversations, right? But the culture we live in is toxic. I mean, look at you know, there's so many. things that we could list here but i don't want to go into that because that's a whole other you know like what you're saying when i was having my thoughts of suicide and when i was going through my dark phase i suddenly and exactly the same thing i was feeling alone nobody is there my friends have disappeared all those kinds of thoughts are going through my head then one fine day i said i'm going to sit and talk to everyone about it just like what you did mm. right and then we were bo- trauma bonding <laughs> Right, I was making friends because we were having these discussions, and I was making friends because we created the safe space to have these discussions with each other, and it was insane. Like earlier on, meeting a new person meant you showed off. Yeah. Now meeting a new person says that you know what I just went through this in my in my life. <gasps> Something similar happened to me also. Shut up! What happened to you? And now you're bonding over something, and you're making, believe it or not. The world is slightly better place by making the other person feel seen in the same way that you're being seen. Being seen. I mean, just look at Instagram. What is everyone trying to do? Right? Like, why are we on this platform? My posting? favorite <laughs> are skincare specialists. Okay. That use filters. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, but like, um, you know, you're like. Yeah, that doesn't make you sense. You already have a filter. It's called makeup. Like why yeah, do it does, you need a does second? That not makes. But I just want to not rebound. That's another thing. I want to bounce <laughs> back on something you said. We're trauma bonding, right? right? That's an actual term, and I just want to make sure people don't get confused. Okay. Because a trauma bond is actually a really unhealthy relationship between It's not that. two. Okay. That, yeah, yeah. Explain. That's why mm. I was just clarifying because. You were bonding through your trauma, Correct. right? Which was like, hey, we're sharing our pain, and it, and it makes us feel closer. Hmm. But trauma bonding actually is, you know, these unhealthy, toxic relationships where we're in this dynamic and we're stuck and we're reliving our trauma through these adult relationships. But one of the things that you said that I that is so evident that I don't understand why we're still stuck in this masquerade of, oh, let me show you how oh, strong I am, whatever, right? is that actually when you're vulnerable with people when you show up really and you're met because you're not always going to be met mm-hmm. that's a risk yes. right yes. which i it was tough for me to go through that and acknowledge that but you actually feel closer who are the people you feel closest to right the people who you've seen in these dark difficult spaces or who have seen you and there's an element of trust right because you've been in those spaces and i'm just thinking Why isn't this the new normal? Like, hey, I'm Lilia. This is my crazy. Hey, Ashdin, what's your crazy? You know, because it's gonna come up anyways. If you relate with anyone for long enough, whatever the kind of relationship, doesn't matter. It is going to show up. It, there's no way around it. There's only you can only pretend for so long. You know, it's unsustainable. So I'm like, why not just be real from the get go? But I know it's tough because. fear of rejection of judgment i mean we live in a highly critical judgmental culture you know that thrives on us hiding feeling not good enough and actually one of the symptoms because trauma has many different symptoms but one of the symptoms of trauma is low sense of self-worth and self-esteem now if you look around you at all the people who have low sense of self-worth and self-esteem you understand how big of a I I don't like the word epidemic or pandemic because it has different connotations today. But it's a widespread thing. You know, it's a widespread phenomena which we're treating as some isolated incident. It's not. It's everybody where we're all in this together. All right, so that was Lilia and we were talking about trauma. Now this was only the first part. Make sure you join us for part 2. Now if you like this podcast, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network. You can listen to us on the IBM Podcast app or ibmpodcast.com. You can also follow us on social media. We are at IBM Podcast on Twitter and Instagram. If you want to reach out to me, I am at Ashton Doc on Twitter and Instagram. We have a brand new habit coaching online course, quizzes, videos, and a lot more on the website awesome180.com. So check it out now.